think one of the things that we've debated over and over again is the issue of jobs and the economics of casino expansion. But I think one of the things that has been sorely missed in this debate and so critical is the fact of the societal cost, the human lives that are impacted. Let me tell you and assure you, this is a people issue. I mean, just imagine you know, how that would feel like all of a sudden everything is gone. I remember that day. It was like before. It was like shortly before Christmas, and uh, it was, um, and I just, it's like I had nothing. You know, my scorecard read zero, as, as they say. Emotionally, and, and feeling that pain of being alone and having nothing. You know, after all those years worked and not having anything at all. It was, it was, it was pretty bleak, you know, not, and, and hurting people close to me. I'm Stephen M and I'm in recovery from problem gambling for 28 years. I first started my gambling um, going to the casino very innocently with friends or neighbors playing bingo on a Sunday afternoon and before long I was um, really heavy into gambling. It was no time at all that um, I was there going to the casino for days but I started very innocently by playing bingo. So as long as I can remember uh, in my life, in my childhood, I struggled with my emotions. I was compelled to do things that I didn't really understand. Um, I had rituals I go through to prevent things from happening like my parents dying. I had in my mind that if I didn't do certain rituals, bad things would happen to me or those I love. And just not understanding those experiences, and, and these were daily, just overwhelming the, the stress, perpetually being in the stress response. And I remember when I was about 12 years old, my grandfather owned racehorses. And we flew out to his home in Montana and went to see one of his horses run. And it's kind of as a, as a fun little, we met the horse in, in the paddock before, and I remember he did a small bet for us, my sister and I. And I remember the feeling I had, this feeling of elation, a feeling of, of normalcy. Again, because I was struggling in so many ways, and it just, Whatever that release of dopamine, whatever it did to me, I felt better when, I, when, when that horse won. And that feeling is a feeling I chased for a lot of years. And as time went on, gambling started to uh, impact other areas of my life, especially my job. I would work, you know, considerable amounts of overtime and, you know, getting paid every two weeks. And I can remember, like, going you know, to the window and liking a horse and just putting my two weeks pay right on the nose like, like it was nothing. And uh, a lot of other things. And, and, I, and I increasingly look for other ways to feel better. And the human body unconsciously goes to seek relief. So if you intentionally seek relief in, in healthy outlets, yoga, meditation, walking, nourishing relationships, that's great. If you don't, your body's gonna find ways to relieve itself, to, to ease the pain. And I, and, I was, and, I, and I went, having had some experience with gambling, having had some really good feelings while I was gambling, I started increasingly gambling, uh, gambling more. And it's interesting now that I think about it, this kind of institutionalized escape we have in this country, where on such a large level, dealing with pain in healthy ways, learning from pain, learning from difficulties, is really not what's done in America in large degree, right? We push the gambling industry, we push, there's cigarettes, there's alcohol, there's the adult industry, it's all these ways of not actually dealing with pain or looking to escape. Artists in rock, pop, and hip-hop, and I 
got to like the hyper state of this, where I was like, I couldn't deal with any negative emotion. So I, whenever I felt anything, I went and tried to stop it with psych meds, benzos, and, and gambling. Um, my problem gambling affected every piece of my life. Um, I lost my home, my 16 year marriage, um, the trust of my family. I lost um, loved ones. I lost my pride. Um, the list just goes on and on. Um, rock bottom for me was when I was arrested for embezzling um, to fund my gambling. And I had to sit down with my um, son, who was nine at the time then, and explain to him what I had done and that I was facing a pretty lengthy prison sentence. Um, at that time, I didn't know how um, long of a sentence I would get, but that um, was the worst day of my life um, when I had to tell him and see his little face that I was going to be leaving him. Sorry. My name is Joni, and I've been in recovery for problem gambling for 12 years. People living with gambling addiction live with it in silence till it gets to a point of breaking. I was able to hide my gambling for many years. I was able to hide my lying from the gambling. Um, so in that aspect, I believe that it's different than other addictions. But I, I think the difference with the gambling addiction is the hidden piece. I remember many times driving home from, from casino or off-track betting, just crying and like pounding the steering wheel and like never again, never again. And it's just like a day or two later, just wanting to go back. My body wanting to be there gambling. Whatever it did for me in those small moments, it, it, it seemed like it was nourishing me and just not being able to see what it was doing. And I also was raised by parents who were very conscious of addiction and would say, be careful with drugs and alcohol a lot of education around where that can lead, but we just didn't know that gambling was in that, in that mix. So here I was being kind of aware of not escaping through cocaine or, or, or other street drugs, but yet just constantly gambling and not, not making the connection. I mean, I would say on, on many levels, I traded my soul for my, my gambling my first wedding on my on the night before my wedding, I placed bets. Day of my wedding, I made sure my bets were placed. So I'm up there exchanging vows with someone I loved, and I'm wondering who won the fourth race at Belmont. And and, and there's that part of me that didn't want to be doing that, but just felt like I couldn't stop. Felt like it was something I needed. Now the reality is. It wasn't about the money. It was about that feeling I had when I gambled. Because I had days when I won, won a lot of money. I had days when I drove there saying, okay, I need to win $2,000 to pay my mortgage so my wife doesn't find out whatever, whatever the case was. And I would win it in like the second race. And I wouldn't stop. It wasn't the money. It was that, whatever that feeling, whatever happens in the moment of the throes of addiction, it was that. That's what I saw. That's what I craved, not the money. I think advocacy eliminated responsibility um, to the community and to the public to really bring um, awareness to the seriousness of gambling addiction. You know, just the, the emotional distress that people experience um, dealing with these um, addictions um, is huge for people that's, that's going through different stresses um, in life from, from these experiences, um, are more prone to, to alcohol and substance abuse. As far as uh, gambling impacting any uh, other addictions in my life, um, I, I believe I, would, I drank alcoholically. You know, and then starting to do some drugs too, and so you know, cocaine in particular. And one thing about the gambling, um, you know, cocaine was expensive, and if I made a big score in gambling, you know, it was party time. Definitely, it fueled my other addictions. I, I want to take a step back and, and and bring back this discussion because this whole debate has really had a feel of David versus Goliath. 
that the casinos and the gambling interest have, have all the resources and all the imagery to be able to portray that this is something that is wonderful for our state. And I think one of the, my colleagues in the Senate said best, in promoting gambling, are we in the road to Pottersville and creating the aftermath of, of, of lives shattered? You know, in, in nearing the end of, of my uh, gambling, I can remember being in my apartment, you know, alone, alienated from, you know, from my relationship with my fiance, and uh, just being in my apartment, they were turning the lights off, I had no money, uh, I was getting, you know, evicted, and it, it was just, it was a miserable existence, it was very, it was lonely, it was very lonely. To remember that our role up here is to represent all of the people all of the interests of the people of Connecticut, not simply the elite few and the deep-pocketed ones. I think that the first thing that is very important to understand about the economics of casino gambling is that almost all of the money that funds the jobs, funds the revenue to the state, all comes from the losses, the gambling losses of the casino's customers. One of our greatest economists, Paul Sanderson, won the Nobel Prize for Economics, has described that as the sterile transfer of money or goods from one group to another without creating any new wealth. So what we're doing is basically taking money from lower and middle income people overwhelmingly and transferring it to the owners of the casinos. The state gets a piece of that money. Let's say that uh, an individual uh, loses $100 at a, at a casino. Well, in Connecticut, if they lost the money at a, at a slot machine, $25 of that money would go to the state of Connecticut. But for the state of Connecticut to get that $25, the customer has to lose $100. So I was in an awful psychiatric hospital and had a few things that took me from that place of utter despair to a place where there's just this little flicker of hope. Because I think it's so important that we believe that we can get through difficult times, but it's also possibly more important that someone else grants us that possibility. So early on rehab, there's this guy named Chris that came up to me and he just said, you're ready to start your life over. And I told him I can't, I had done all these awful things and I deserve to die. And then he showed some of his, told me some of his narrative, showed me a scar in his head where he had put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger when he thought he couldn't go forward. He showed me pictures of this beautiful woman, these cute kids in this house. And he said, that's his life now, his wife and his kids. And he showed me, told me about the beach he walks on every day and that he works in this rehab facility, helping people and how he feels fulfilled. And then he told me how he did it. And it was really important, and I think the, those narratives of, of hope sustained me during this really dark time, that maybe, maybe I could be someone that could learn some lessons and, and come back and, and be of value. The other really important thing was my wife, Carrie, she flew down to Florida where I was to see me. Um, you know, she flew down to see me and, and she saved me. She saved me. But the fact that this beautiful, amazing person thought it was possible allowed me to take another step in that journey. For me, looking for that journey, like if I could find some meaning in, in all this suffering and help others, maybe, just maybe, I could have a life after all that. And then over the next several years and for the rest of my life, hopefully, I, I, I've been surrounded by these amazing people who show me, you know, people that, 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 that rock bottom is an opportunity to be something more. Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, said, Ruin is a gift. 
Ruin is the road to transformation. My name is Darren Drum. I placed my last bet in the beginning of 2010. You know, and going forward, you know, after like, you know, hitting my bottom with, um, you know, with drugs and alcohol and, and nearing the end of my gambling, it was, um, you know, I just had like an awakening. I just said, I can't, God, I can't live like this anymore. I needed help. I just, I needed, I needed help. I knew somebody in recovery. Um, I reached out to them and, uh, and they were there for me. I don't know where I would be without them. You know, they were real powers of example for me. You know, they, they showed me that, you know, if they could do it, I could do it. You know, I know that there's their support. Um, there. We do have a support group here at, at Advocacy Unlimited that we um, support people with those experiences. Um, having um, prevention is just ways of just letting the public know uh, the effects that uh, problem gambling or gambling addiction have, you know, and just the advocacy and, uh, and, uh, and the awareness on a legislative level, on a state level, is very important for us at Advocacy Limited to um, address these issues. Um, I had no choice to turn my life around and change my life um, while incarcerated. Um, I was fortunate to be part of a gambling intervention um, group that is no longer available in the prison, but at the time I was there, it was. So I took advantage of that group and was able to have uh, treatment set up for myself upon my release from prison with the counseling, going to groups, um, getting involved in a lot of different um, treatment elements that um, helped me to change my life and to work on my recovery. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be able to be sitting here today. Where I felt pain, I sought to escape it. Whether it was through gambling or sex or, or drinking, I need to find ways to, to experience pain better. So meditation was the biggest tool for me to help kind of slow things down. So I spent so many years impulsively reacting to stressors, to people. Meditation gave me just a little bit of time to thoughtfully respond. So it's not that I didn't feel irritated by people, it's not like I didn't feel desires to run. I had a little more of a time to thoughtfully respond the way I want to and intentionally choose how I was gonna go forward. Yoga was really important because it got me back into my body. To be in my body and to move through stressful situations. Eating nourishing food, really important. I have, figuring out what goes in my body, what causes uh, unhealthy feelings, like sugar, not good for me. I think I've given up alcohol, given up gambling, but looking at the um, impact of gluten I made, impact on certain animal proteins, is really uh, eating healthy, nourishing, natural foods was important. Also surrounding myself by people that that just nourished me and, and, and me them. Being around people that, that I admire, that, that I felt were really working hard in their lives and their ways of being. People that I learn from, um, people I feel listen to me and I, I feel like I listen to them and then it was a process. <laughs> um, one of the uh, messages I would love to share as part of my story is that when I was actually, while I was gambling and when I came um, clean with my gambling addiction was I was so hopeless. Um, I saw no way out of, um, you know, fixing the destruction I had caused. I was hopeless to the extent that I attempted suicide. Um, and I just want to share that there is a lot of hope. Um, there's a lot of ways to get hope back in your life, and that's what I work today at, is sharing hope with others that um, your life doesn't have to be hopeless. And um, if you get into the right support network, you can become very hopeful again. 
hope is the biggest thing in the beginning if things would get better. The new regional local casinos drain wealth from communities, weaken nearby businesses, hurt property values, and reduce civic participation, family stability, and other forms of social capital that are at the heart of a successful community. As a person in recovery from problem gambling, I share my story and journey with this addiction so that people are aware of the human cost behind allowing more gambling expansion in our state. Problem gambling can destroy lives and families, and that's exactly what it did to my life. This is an issue that cuts across all the class lines. It affects every family within vicinity of the gambling casinos. It is not gaming, no matter what they call it. This is about who we want to be with one another as the state of Connecticut. We cannot, we must not allow any more casinos, not this one and not any others in the future. you.